Good evening. It is uh, 6.04 p.m. on uh, Thursday, um, May, oh shoot, I forgot the date, 19? <laughs> 20. I'm sorry, that's what happens when we're home for a year and a couple of months. So it's Thursday, May 20, uh, 6.04 p.m., and I am bringing this session a special meeting of the National Board of Education to order. Um, a couple of gentle reminders before we get started. Um, we do have a mask mandate within the schools, so I'm asking everyone to uh, maintain social distancing and wear your mask. Um, the exception is for people when they're speaking into the microphones. Um, it's difficult for these microphones to pick us up um, if we have the mask on, so remove your mask to speak and then put it back on. Um, so, this evening uh, we are conducting structured interviews um, of our uh, candidates for um, superintendent. Uh, we've been working uh, tirelessly over the last few months. Uh, we have uh, interviewed uh, several people and we are excited to um, speak with uh, Dr. Robinson this evening. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Bishop, could you please call the roll? Ms. Bishop is here. Ms. Giglio? Here. Mr. Uh, sorry, Ms. Raymond? Here. Ms. Odin? Here. Ms. Brown? Here. Ms. Johnson? Present. Mr. Garino? Here. Ms. Zeem? Here. Ms. Timmons? Here. Welcome. Thank you, everybody. Ms. Brown, would you lead us in the pledge, please? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, 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 States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Um, also, just a gentle reminder, there are extra masks and hand, sanita hand sanitizer on the desk in the front left side of the room uh, from your side. So um, this evening, I would like to welcome Dr. Terrence Robinson, uh, the school support officer from the Houston Independent School District. Uh, Dr. Robinson, thank you so much for coming up uh, to meet with us this evening. Thank you guys for having me. All right. Certainly. Yep. Thank you guys uh, for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks. So um, we've asked Dr. Robinson to prepare a 15-minute presentation outlining um, a 90-day entry plan, um, including uh, summer activities and return to school activities. Um, so we've got it primed up on the big screen. Um, and if Ms. Uh, Giglio could please hit the lights, I'll get out of the way. Okay. Take it away, Dr. Robinson. So good evening to those who are uh, joining us uh, through the television as well as the internet and our board, the board here today. I, I am truly honored to be here and to be invited to present to you today. My name is Terrence Robinson. I am currently a school support officer in the Houston Independent School District. And I don't believe it's by accident that I'm sitting here. I believe there has been a lot of time, preparation, and studying that has led me to this point um, and why I am here tonight. Uh, I have some people who are, who are looking at me from home and, and they're rooting for me. And those people include my family as well as those who have supported me through this educational journey, some of my uh, former bosses and some of my principals. So I'm prepared. I'm prepared and ready for this particular opportunity. So again, thank you to the board for having me. So what I have prepared today is a, what I said, a 100-day entry plan. So I did give myself an extra 10 days, so I do apologize about being <laughs> greedy with the time frame. But I uh, just wanted to kind of look at it from uh, three phases, and so we're going to go through this this roadmap. So it's a roadmap forward. Uh oh, kind of jumped on me a little bit. Sorry about that. This thing kind of skips a little bit. That's no, not not moving at all. Okay, Pete, Doug, any suggestions? 
I don't know if Doug's looking at us. Oh. Okay, ah. he's jumping though. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, so when, when I look at Nashua and the history behind everything that you guys have established here, let me be very frank with you right now. I am not the guy who that just jumps in and says, okay, this is wrong, this is wrong, let's just change this, change that, change that. That's not Terrence Robinson. I've never worked that way. I've always been someone who's looked at a situation, tried to examine it thoroughly, and looked at all components and aspects of that particular situation and how can I benefit the situation. That's where we are today is I've tried to design something that is beneficial to you as a district, but in the end, it has to move our students' performance because it's all about the academic outcomes that we produce as students. And that's what I really want us to focus on as a board when I'm presenting to you is how is what Terrence Robinson is saying today going to move the needle? So the three phases, phase one, I'm not trying to hit the ground running. I know you've heard that cliche. I'm gonna hit the ground learning, quite frankly. I've already started that process. I've looked at your data, I've looked at the various reports, I've read a lot of news articles, I've had a lot of conversations. I am learning about Nashua and how I can benefit this particular district and this community. And so looking at a time frame of July through September 20, 2021, I want to learn what the strengths, the needs, and the challenges of this district are. Phase two, achieving success as a team. That will include data analysis and team collaboration. That also includes everybody who's sitting in front of me. Terrence Robinson, this is not a solo. I told you on the last call, I, I, I cannot sing. <laughs> so I, I'm all about the group, okay? I'm not a solo artist. And so I want to work with you guys as a team to build that up. And that has to go down and matriculate through our principals, through our direct reports, our assistant superintendents, and then through the teachers and then the students. And then phase three, the next steps. So out of phase one and two, what are the strategic action plans that we're going to create? So now that we have, we've looked at the, the learning that's taken place, we've had those conversations, we've, we've done a SWOT analysis, where we looked at the strengths, the opportunities, the threats, as well as those needs, and then we're looking at phase two, where we're looking at data. Now, what's the plan to move forward? Those are the three phases that I would like to talk about briefly to, tonight, is how we implement these things uh, by from, from now, July 1st, until November 21st, 2021. And so phase one, again, I talked about it a little earlier. <laughs> Listening and learning sessions. That includes having one-on-one -on -one sessions, that includes group meetings, that includes uh, conversations with district, district leadership teams, central office, parents, community members, teacher groups, student groups, Every organization who I, who I find to be that um, uh, integral in moving the needle, we will meet with them. And I'll even meet with those who think they are and they may not be. I'll have that conversation as well. Because one of the things I, I often believe is that everybody's input is needed. I, it's not my job to say this group is not as important as this group. I want to hear from everybody. Because it, it, may not, I may, it may not be the whole entire thing that's in, in, important, but there may be one or two things from that that we can actually pull together and compromise and come up with some, some real solutions. So that's what's gonna be involved with phase one. Now, the, the critical information that we're gonna gain from this is gonna develop uh, our, our next opportunity. So we're gonna look at our strengths. We're gonna look at those things that we're, we're missing out on, those opportunities that we're missing on, and then those threats because we have to start thinking outward and not necessarily inward, because when we think outward, we're talking about future. Because there are things that are, that are gonna be affecting us three or four years now that are not affecting us right now. But that's thinking ahead, so when those, that, that time frame comes, we'll already be prepared for it. We already have things in place to, to, uh, to address those things as they come. Again, we were looking at uh, the, the, the quantitative and qualitative data. We're gonna work closely with district and, and campus leaders team, leadership teams to conduct comprehensive reviews of support systems. Our teachers need to be supported. They need to feel supported. 
my, my first question to them is, what do you need to be successful? Because if I'm not, I'm not giving you the, the, the tools that you need to be successful, then the house that we're going to build is not going to, it's not going to stand. We have to give them the best, the best nails, the best, the best concrete cement, and the best materials that they can provide and put it, go in that classroom and make sure that our kids are successful, not just through, through 12th grade, but I'm thinking the future because we have to have kids that are college and career ready. So we have to make sure that we're building that into our systems. And it, uh, uh, in addition, we're looking at student performance in phase two. How, how does our student performance look compared to other districts? How are we looking? Because that's what parents want. Parents want the best. Parents want to know that their district is, co is competitive when it comes to student scores and outcomes. No one wants to be a part of something they don't feel is, is, is benefiting their, their child. So we have to put a, uh, the, the necessary tools forward to make sure that we have the systems in place to produce those outcomes. And so we're looking at our data very carefully, very carefully and critically, putting in measures to address where those, those pitfalls are for our data. Where, where is our data not uh, producing in the ways that we want? Those are the areas we need to support. So we have a very close look. But when you look at data, I'm not just talking about numbers. I'm not talking about numbers specifically. There's a lot of qualitative data that I think we overlook. We overlook conversations. We overlook feedback. Those are critical. So I'm not just talking about numbers. I'm talking about that information that we can gain from surveys. I'm talking about information we can gain from focus groups. How can we put all of this information together to produce an outcome? And that's what we're gonna talk about in phase three. So phase three will, will consist of compiling all of those collective efforts. And we're gonna develop what we consider to be National's, National's Strategic Action Plan. And this plan will be presented to you guys for your approval. And so inside of that plan, we're gonna combine phases one and two to say this is our plan forward to actually move this district to the next phase. Because again, we're looking at outcomes. We're looking at academic achievement levels of our students. Are our students successful? And that's what the transition plan will be centered around, is trying to make sure, I'm sorry, the action plan will be centered around, is trying to make sure that we've developed tight systems and, and, and supports to move the needle. And then accountability. I expect, I'm not sitting here because I expect a free ride. I want you to hold me accountable as a superintendent of this district. And I, am, and I plan to hold my direct reports accountable. I plan to hold the, the principals accountable. There has to be a system of accountability and that accountability goes down and it comes right back up to me because it starts with me. I'm sitting in this chair because I accept responsibility and accountability for what I, 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 I take over or I supervise. I take accountability for that. And if it's not good, I'm the person that you hold responsible. But I'm gonna make sure that we're gonna do everything we can to, to make sure that those scores look good and that we are held accountable for those. So what are we trying, what are we talking about? I believe there's truly an, a culture of opportunity here. And so I, I wanna promise you four things when I look at the culture of opportunity. There's four things I want us to, to, to look at as a board and as me as a candidate that we are going to commit to greatness. That we are going to commit as a team to greatness. And then we're going to commit that we're going to have a passion for work. That when you're here, we're going to have not a 100%, we're going to go above that, if there's such a thing. We're going to put all that we have into what we're doing. And then respect, we're going to live by the golden rule. We're going to treat others the way that we want to be treated. That's just the golden rule. And then accountability, I talked about that a little earlier. Now. With all of these, if we hold each other accountable for this culture of opportunity and these guiding principles, guess what's gonna happen? It's just gonna go all the way down through the district because everybody's looking at us to see, can we do this? Can we pull this off? And I'm telling you, we can pull it off. We can do it. So what I'm gonna do now is quickly, I'm gonna break down each one of the phases, but I'm gonna talk about the goals. Uh, the, the, the goals within the phases. But before I do that, I want to introduce you to what I consider my three A's. That's accessibility. As, as a as superintendent of this district, I'm gonna be an active member. I enjoyed surfs last night. I enjoyed it. 
And I, I enjoy just sitting at the bar and having conversations. I enjoyed sitting at the Courtyard Marriott bar, drinking, drinking cranberry juice last night, <laughs> but, but, but engaging in a conversation about this area. When, when I asked for a, a recommendation for a, rec a restaurant, she gave me some restaurant in Merrimack. I said, I cannot go to Merrimack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm eating in Nashua. And I couldn't tell her why. She said, yes, sir, I got you. I, I, I'm going to send you to Serps. But, but that's, but, but that's what, what, I, what I believe in. I believe when, I, when I'm all in, I'm all in. Like, I'm not going in one foot in. I'm going in two feet in with, with both arms. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be a part of this community. So that's accessible. That's accessibility. Well, you, you're going to know I'm here. You're not going to just think I'm a figurehead and I'm just, no, I'm here. I'm in buildings. I'm meeting with principals. I'm, I'm having lunch with kids. I'm meeting with students. I'm at the baseball game. I want to stop so bad last night and go to, to the Little League game. But I said, you know what, that's, that's doing a little too much right now. But that's just the kind of person I am. I love that. And, and then availability. People talk about having an open door policy, but they're always in the office with the door closed. <laughs> okay, that, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So, you know, as I told you, you all on, on, the, on the call, hey, I have an open door policy, but when you come in that office, nobody's probably going to be there because I'm going to be out. <laughs> I believe in being in the work. If you're not in the work, you're in the way. That, a principal told me that at one of my, one of my uh, turnaround campuses. He said, Ms. Robinson, when you come to my campus, if you're not in the work, you're in the way. So that means you got to come in these rooms with us. I said, hey, that's no problem. I'm going to steal that idea. That's what I told him. <laughs> because that, that, that makes, uh, that, that's, that's what principals are supposed to do. They're supposed to be in the work. And superintendents should be the same way. And then accountability. I talked about that uh, uh, earlier. Let's hold each other accountable. Let's hold each other to task. Iron truly does sharpen iron. And so... I, I am, I'm approachable. I believe that, that I'm, I'm not the, the smartest person in the room, and I will never, ever try to be the smartest person in the room. But I'm going to bring people in with me, and we're going to work together to build that smart person. Because there are some things that I, I don't have all of, the, all of the answers. I don't. I don't. If I, if I did, I'd probably be the, the head of the Department of Education or something right now. I don't have the, I'm not that guy. I'm still working. I'm still learning. And that's about growth. And I'm not afraid to grow. One of my supervisors, Dr. Sam Sarabri, told me this. He said, Terrence, if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you're rotting. <laughs> he said, if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you're rotting. Continue to grow. And, and that's something I, I have never forgotten. In 13 years, he told me that 13 years ago. And that still blows me away. Because when people continue to grow in their craft, they continue to get better. If you're in a business and you think you know it all and you have all the answers, but you're not seeking any type of help to, to, to sharpen your tools, to make yourself a little better, to get updated with, with the newest in technology, the newest in tools, then you're not benefiting our kids because our kids don't learn the same that they learned 10 years ago. They don't learn the same they learned a one year ago. Let's just be honest, okay? So things change, and we, as professionals, we have to change with that. But that's about being accountable as well. So going on to goal one, because I have five of them, and I don't know where my time is, but I'm, I'm going to get there. So we want to establish a collaborative and positive, productive working relationship. And that is to ensure a, a cohesive board superintendent leadership team. That's what I want to do. That's my first goal. And, and, and when we do that, the, some of the objectives, because they're lengthy, I'm not going to go into all of them, but we're going to work together. I'm going to be leading some, some, type, some trainings with you. We're going to have board workshops. I love to present. I think in my, in my, in my, old, in my old life, I probably should have been an actor, because I love to perform. <laughs> but, but that performance is about engaging you. So I love to put on professional developments where I can learn with you and facilitate that learning. Because we have to be engaged in the learning process if we're going to move this district forward. And so I have some other goals here. Again, I, I talked about the transition plan that I'm planning to share with you. We're going to establish a culture of trust. Guys, I am approachable. I, I want to establish routine and, and, and consistent meetings with you where you can come to me and tell me what you're thinking. 
Now, we may not agree on 100% of it. We might even agree on 30% of it. But trust me, you're going to say he listened to me. You're going to say that because I am a listener. I'm an active listener. I, don't, I, I, I talk a lot now, but I asked Ms. Brown to do a lot of listening today, <laughs> a lot of listening, because I like to study a situation and like to understand how I can benefit that particular situation. So we talked about the one-on-one -on -one meetings, the regular meetings with uh, our board president to kind of figure out what, what the, uh, uh, the direction is and we look at uh, board agendas and set those things as well. Uh, we will look at um, the predetermined uh, means of communication. So we're talking about uh, Twitter presence, Facebook presence, uh, website, making sure things are, are presentable. But at the same time, we're talking about uh, building a team culture in everything that we do. This is not Terrence Robinson's communication to you, to, to, to Nashua. This is the, the school district of Nashua, which you guys are included in. Go to create opportunities for diverse perspectives to be held, to build strong, collaborative, productive relationships with all stakeholders. I wore a red tie tonight with a blue suit. <laughs> you get it? Okay. You get it. Uh -huh. I don't really care how anybody votes. All I care about is kids. I have a 10 year old who will be attending school in Nashville if I'm selected for this position. I care that my daughter is getting the best education out there. And I don't care how somebody votes. All I care about is student outcomes. When we look at uh, these, the the uh, goal number two, we're looking at high expectations, focus on improving academic achievement, bottom line. Within that, we're looking at uh, partnerships. Who can we bring in to also meet that particular goal? We want to look at professional collaborative relationships. We want to also uh, look at how we can bring in professional development. How can we get the message out as well to increase our outlook for those relationships? Goal three, uh, efficient and structured transition of leadership focus on instructional improvements. If you notice, instruction is at the top of my list tonight. Academic outcomes, I said it earlier, I'm gonna be focused on it heavily. So we're gonna, re we're gonna look at our academic outcomes, looking at our achievement expectations. And I'm not, now let me, let me be careful and, and, and stop for a second. I'm not talking about just tier three students because I have a wealth of knowledge in working with our struggling learners, but I wanna make sure that our tier one kids have the opportunities to, to attend Dartmouth, that they're competitive to get into Harvard. So we're talking about increasing pre-AP, uh, AP, uh, dual language if possible, all of these things to, 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 to challenge our students to be competitive. Because when they leave this district, they have to come back and say, this district prepared me. Not for the 12th grade, but for life. And that's where we kind of miss sometimes in education because we're so focused on the little things and get them to the next grade. I'm talking about preparing our kids for life and how to survive. So if, if we're gonna look at all of our components of academics, we're gonna look at our CTE, we're gonna look at how do our parents affect that as well. So parent involvement is crucial. Um, we're gonna assess and monitor student intervention systems. Now here's my tier three. Here's my tier three. We have babies out there who just need a little push. They may need a little extra time. But we have to provide those resources for these students to be successful. I told you guys last week, I don't believe there's a such thing as academic gaps and achievement gaps. I don't believe that. In my research, I found that there are only opportunity gaps. That if you give every kid the same opportunity, they will, have the, they will produce. Mm -hmm. And that in, my, in my research and in my studies, as well as the work that I've done in, inside of some of these schools where our kids are struggling, when we put and give them, give them the same opportunities, these kids perform. And our kids can perform, but it's, it is truly about the opportunities. Go for, I realize I'm about to, get, I'm about to be gung, so I don't want to do that. <laughs> but financial, so we're going to look at... Um, uh, efficiencies, uh, effectiveness and efficiency of high accountability standards, but we're also going to look at our financial status. We're going to look at our, 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 how are we spending our money? 
Are we spending it, are we getting more bang for our buck? Are we looking at things effectively? And so we're going to look at, I, I, I applaud you, I, I read the, the news article about you guys joining um, the, 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 with the concerns about stu, uh, school finance. I applaud you for that. Um, all district and campus budgets are effectively and efficiently aligned with district goals. You know, things have to go down. So if it's not a district goal, we have to make sure that we're spending money that's aligned with what we say we're going to do here. Um, and then are we, are, we, are we monitoring those things? Are we, we, we can't just have a program because, you know, this is what we've always done. And, and, we're not, it's, and it's not producing anything from it. So are we managing that and are we making sure that we're getting more bang for our buck on that particular plan? I'm almost done, guys. <laughs> uh, and then, and lastly, go five. Assess the strengths, needs, and challenges pertaining to safety, climate, attendance, and discipline to develop and implement systems that support all schools. Now, I mentioned earlier about qualitative and quantitative data. So when you look at these components, it's not all about achievement, but I can guarantee you safety, climate, attendance, and discipline. If you improve those, guess what else improves? Guess what else improves? Your academic outcomes improve. If kids are able to focus in school and they feel safe, guess what they're going to be focused on? They're not going to be focused that somebody's going to come through that door. They're going to be focused on what that teacher's teaching. If kids come to school, consistently, then guess what? They have more opportunities and better opportunities to learn. And then the discipline. We have to keep our kids in school. We have to find other ways. You know, suspension is not always the answer. It's not. So we have to find ways to keep our kids in school. And so looking at discipline, looking at alternative methods to make sure that our kids are here, they're learning, and, and everybody feels safe. So th those are the five goals. Let me keep going. I'm gonna, if, I, if it's okay, um, President Raymond, I have a, a slide that I'm going to explain with my lapel. Can I come back to that slide? Is that, is that okay when I close out? Do you want to come back at the end to it? I want to come back at the end, yes, ma'am, because you did ask, ask the question earlier, so I want to explain that. All right, does anyone have an objection? No. No. All right, seeing none, that's fine. Okay. So the, the last thing I wanted to address is is our, our COVID-19. So we, we talked about re-entry to school. We've been in school in Houston since face-to-face -face since October. Since October. Now, has it always all been smooth? No. But let me tell you what we've done. We put in safety provisions. We've, we've aligned our classrooms where kids are spaced out. Classrooms are clean on a regular basis. Um, I can sit in a hallway at a school and I can see, if I stay there three hours, that custodian is gonna come through there three times wiping down doors. So it's consistent cleaning. Kids, we need our kids back in school. We need them back. We need them back. And I am committing to you, if, if, if you are selecting me, our kids are gonna be back in school. But let me give you a, a little caveat to that. We have to work as a board to create a plan to safely get them back in school. Because if we let our guard down, then all we're gonna do is be out again. So we have to make sure that we have a plan. And that's what, I, that's what I'm committed to doing. I would like our kids to be back on day one. Now, as a, as a fallback, I do have what I consider option one and two, okay? So safety first in person, that's option one. Option two would be what you guys already have would be remote learning. We do have some parents who we, well, I, I do understand who are still cautious. I get it. So having that fall back as a remote learning option at this particular point, I think it's still too early to say everybody has to be back unless it's mandated. I think we still need to have that option of remote learning. But I am committed to you tonight to say that we need to have our kids back in school on day one in person. But again, it's going to be up to us to figure out how that looks. And that's what I want to leave, with you, leave you with tonight, specifically with the COVID-19 provisions. It's reimagine re and reconnect. That's what I entitled this slide. Because our, our, the way we educate is not going to always, not going to look the same, probably for a long time. So we have to reimagine what school looks like. But at the same time, we have to reconnect these kids. Our kids are not learning at the same levels that, that they are or that they have been at home. They're just not. 
Let's, let's not fool ourselves. Let's not fool ourselves. So um, in, the, in the COVID plan, option one, and then an option two as a fallback for those parents who are insisting that, that, they're, 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 that their kids are not to return. However, uh, again, this is all um, pending the guidance from the governor whatever uh, whatever's decided from uh, the state capitol uh, as far as students and attendance, because we all know that students need to be in school, that counts for attendance, it counts for money. So we have to, that also has to be weighed as well. So um, this, this is gonna conclude the 100 day plan, I added 10 days, uh, and the COVID-19 provisions. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Robinson. Um, Ms. Giglio? always takes a minute to adjust. All right, thank you so much for that. We'll leave the screen up then um, okay. until the end um, so that you can go back to um, your last slide. Um, so um, Dr. Robinson had mentioned in, when he uh, opened his presentation um, that a lot, oh, I forgot to take my mask off. Sorry, I'll, it still feels really weird to me to take a mask off. Um, I, I have an autoimmune disease, so it's been a long time since I've been out of my house and like open face. It feels really odd, so please bear with me. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Robinson um, pointed out that um, there was a long process um, before uh, he came and got in that seat. Um, and I think we need to recognize that. Um, tonight we're doing a structured interview um, and that the questions that we are um, asking um, have directly come from a leadership profile that the citizens of Nashua created um, through interactions with our consulting company, BWP. Um, we had, I wanna see the number is um, 2,879 citizens provide um, input into this leadership profile um, through surveys and focus groups. Um, then BWP used that leadership pro profile to comb through um, dozens of applications um, to narrow it down for us. Um, so Dr. Robinson has already been through, I think three rounds of interviews at this point. Um, so we're pretty excited to have him here. And I think it's important for the public to know um, that uh, he has um, passed several rounds of interviews based on the community profile of a leadership um, that the community is looking for in a superintendent in Nashua. Um, so this evening, our next um, item will be to have the board members ask questions that were developed um, specifically based on that leadership profile. Um, poor Dr. Robinson has not seen uh, these questions uh, yet, um, so this will be a surprise to, to him and everybody um, who isn't a board member. Um, so we decided tonight, uh, last time we did random order, we decided tonight to just go um, by alphabetically by last name because we haven't been in the board room in a while and it just seemed practical. Um, so uh, assuming that I can um, remember my alphabet from kindergarten, uh, Ms. Bishop, uh, you're first. <clears throat> Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Robinson. Can you turn on your... It is on, I'm just not used to being so close to it. Okay, thank you. Um, my first question is, how would you go about evaluating the effectiveness of the administrative team? If you, were to, if you were to decide some realignment was necessary, how would you go about making a change? Thank you, Ms. Bishop, for that question. As, as I stated earlier in the presentation, I think it's important that I, I look at the, the talent level that we have, and um, I'm not that kind of person to just jump and make decisions, and so a conversation would definitely take place, Some se a series of conversations would take place. Uh, I would uh, specifically ask for uh, artifacts, to, uh, uh, so it would basically be a job interview if you wanna put it that way. So not necessarily that, that they're interviewing for their job, but that I have a sense of, com of comfortability with, with who's working with me. I have to I have, to have um, a, a feeling of that the person that's, uh, the assistant superintendents, for example, they're there to, 
to support principals. I have to be, I feel comfort that they know how to do that. And so I'm going to be asking some questions on that. I'm going to be asking about them, asking about their level of experience. I'm going to be asking how, they, how can they support me? At the same time, there has to, I have to be comfortable with their relationship, but I, I definitely would be evaluating it thoroughly. It's again, it's not, a, I, I just don't jump and make decisions. I'm not, I'm not an impulsive person. I move around a lot. I may, may be a lot of real am, animated at times, but I'm not an impulsive person. I do not make impulsive decisions. And so um, it, it would definitely be a, a, a series of interviews and process uh, to evaluate the, the talent that we have. And then, you know, at, at, that, at the same time, just making sure that the, the, the plan that we're developed, that these people can assist me in carrying it out. There has to be a match. It can't just be someone because you're there, you know, you, you have that position, but everybody will have that opportunity. I, I, I do believe that. I'm, I'm not coming in to clean house. I'm in coming here to evaluate, and I mean evaluate, the talent that's here and to make sure that they're the talent that we need and I need to carry out the vision for this district. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. Brown. Thank you. So my first question is uh, about how large of a budget have you managed in the past? If you could describe the budget making process that you've used or you prefer and how you would decide to make reductions and redirect funds for determining priorities. So that's a great question. I have the unique uh, opportunity as a principal uh, to work with my budget. In our district, we have uh, decentralized budgets. And so as principals, when I was a principal, we, we balanced our own budget. We were, we were the CFOs of our budgets. And, and we were giving pots of money to say, hey, you know, this is what you have to do with it. You, you hire as many staff as you feel that you can afford. We're giving a matrix to do that. And so um, at the largest school, I would say about $2 million budget. Uh, uh, for, for that particular campus, that, I, that was probably my largest campus. But I have worked in, in, in a centralized and a decentralized uh, school districts, so I've seen both ways. Um, I, I think the decentralized uh, model uh, does not, it, let me say it this way, it takes away from the needed resources because if you are a principal who has to balance a budget and you think that you need a, a another English teacher over a librarian, for example, the, often a librarian will be left out. And and you know schools need librarians. But that would be a decision that we would be that we would have to make because we had to balance a budget. Uh, the school district that I worked in where we had centralized budgets, there were centrally funded positions that we had to maintain. And so that, that was an easier component to, to work with. Um, we, we, we had those, those, those needed positions, counselor, um, uh, librarians, uh, nurses. I mean, I've worked in the, I was a school, uh, principal of a school that didn't have a nurse because that was a decision we had to make as a principal. You know, that, that's just the, the, the function of the decentralized budget. So we have to share a nurse with another campus. And that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. So um, I definitely would, would do that. I uh, think that's a, the, the decentralized model is a, is a better model. But um, I, I think the, the, the most comp important thing that you need to know about me in budgets is people call me cheap. <laughs> okay? I am as frugal as they come. Okay, I really am. I people like that, people that are watching me at home probably laughing right now, and they're gonna they're say he's not lying. <laughs> but but I, I am I am frugal when it comes to myself, okay? Because I always think about a rainy day, and I like to have money stowed away. You know, I like to ha I like to know if something happens, I'm good. So that that's 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 how I I usually function. But when when it comes to school districts and, and possible cuts, for example, we always have to look at central office first. We we want to make sure that any cuts that we make, we are keeping away from schools because those directly impact our students. Central office would be, you know, some of the uh, extra professional development people possibly. You know, uh, um, uh, training, can we do training in a different way? I'm just throwing out different things that you possibly could cut other than from the campus. Because campus wants to be the last thing that you, that you want to cut from. So when I'm looking at poss if possible cuts would, would, would come our way, we would have to look that way first before going to the schools. Thank you. 
Dr. Robinson. Hi. Yes, ma'am. How would you, I'm a retired school librarian, by the yes, way, so I appreciate you mentioning <laughs> librarians. <laughs> got a, got a um, notch that time, right? <laughs> Ms. Giglio, could you pull your um, microphone closer? Okay, can you hear me better? That's better. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. How would you conduct an assessment of the district's academic and extracurricular programs to determine if the needs of all student groups are being addressed? <laughs> So I think I think the easiest way is to just to just to have a general audit of those functions, and to look at um, the intended outcomes versus what the actual outcomes are, and to measure if what we are we are we getting the outcomes that we are supposed to be getting from it. Uh, I think that's the, the easiest way to assess that. Um, but I, that, those are also conversations as, as well, because I think if you bring in. Um, these individuals, say, you know, an athletic director, and, or, or um, the, the the head of a, the, the the English or the math or uh, department of curriculum, they will tell you ways to, things that are not working. You know, if you give people opportunity to 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 say, okay, well, what's not working? They'll tell you. And they'll tell you that, hey, that, that, that this is not, you know, we're not getting the biggest bang for our buck. This is not a use, a good use of money. And, and that, that, so that, that would really definitely be one of the things that I would do is, is just to bring those individuals in and, and let's do an assessment of it. Let's do an audit. I, I want to audit um, your, your, your particular departments and let's determine, are we getting the outcomes that are intended? And if we're not getting the outcomes that are intended, then we need to make some changes, whether that be cuts or whether that be uh, some adjustments. But that, that would definitely determine that we, we would, we would ne definitely need to do some adjustments there. So I think um, to, to, to quickly answer your, answer, your question, it's definitely to do uh, an audit and an assessment of uh, the various departments to determine what those are. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Garino. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Hi, Dr. Robinson. Yes, sir. Um, can you please describe an example of your ability to simplify and communicate a, a complex matter to others? Wow, that, that is a great question. And before I answer, I want to say it's good to, to hear your voice tonight early instead of late, because the, the last time I thought the ladies just weren't, weren't letting you talk. I was wondering, you know, I was, <laughs> I was a little worried over there, but no, I appreciate you. Um, so I, I, I think the, the best way to communicate is to make sure that you're doing it, it, it verbally as well as uh, written. And so um, with that, it, it involves a direct conversation though. Uh, I am truly my daddy's son. And when I say that, if you ask me a question, I'm gonna give you that response. And so I tell people all the time, before you finish that question, be prepared for their response. Because I, I don't believe in sugarcoating it. As one of my principals told me one time, she said, Terrence, don't ever tiptoe around the tulips. And so I don't believe in tiptoeing around the tulips. I believe in giving it to you straight. Because again, as I told you guys on the call last week, you're gonna be mad at me if I don't tell you the truth. So you being mad at me because I told you the truth, I'm okay with that. I am perfectly fine with that. But what I'm not fine with is you saying you did not, you weren't honest, you, were, you didn't tell us the truth, you weren't transparent. I, I, I don't think that's a good look. And so I do believe in being up, up front, being forward. But, at, but, but tactful at the same time. Now my dad is, he's, he doesn't have any tact. I have, I'm, I'm very tactful, so I am, I am my daddy's son, but I'm very tactful with it. I know how to communicate effectively. I know how to talk to people. I believe I can, I can have a conversation with basically anybody because I'm gonna find something that we have in common. It may be something way down the line. I'm gonna go find it and then I'm gonna engage you in that. But that's also about being transparent, it's also about being approachable, and that's going out into the community and having those conversations. I, 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 I try to do that as much as possible in these, these two days without you know, killing myself, but that was important for me to do that to, uh, the, the, these last two days. It was important for me to get out it was important for me to sit down and just have a conversation with regular residents. They didn't know who I was, what I was here for. They thought I was crazy. Yo, you, you, you just here in Nashua? Yes, I'm just here in Nashua. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I couldn't tell them the, the whole story. But, but, you know, but they, they, they weren't shy about just having a conversation. 
And I listened and, I, and we talked and we engaged and we talked about everything. I, I, you know, what I learned, I, I, you know, it's not everything. And there was nothing that's educational, I can tell you that. But it's just a conversation. I know I can never afford a house in Nantucket. How about that? <laughs> you know, it, it, these are the kind of conversations that we, we engage in. But that's all about getting out with the people and being transparent about um, th those conversations. Again, um, we will have an effective communication plan here if I'm superintendent. Written and verbal, we will have that. We will be out in the community. We will have regular sessions with the community. We, um, um, my, my Twitter handle and, and, and email address will be public. I believe in that. I looked on you guys' website. You guys' phone numbers are on the website. Mm -hmm. I was so impressed by that. And I said, wow, that's, that's interesting. I don't think I've ever seen that before. But hey, <laughs> they can't say they don't know how to find you, <laughs> right? So I think, the, but I think that's important. I think that's important in, in people knowing that, you know, you are accessible. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson? Thank you. You charmed me over with my accent. Oh, and you knew you know exactly Johnson, where you know. I was from, you know? I'm the only one on the board here with a New York accent, so you picked it up. You no, know, you like have that. me in a trance over here when I'm listening to your voice. Come on now. <laughs> um, discuss what you believe should be the relationship between the superintendent and the board. How would you go about establishing the, rep, uh, the relationship? So I think I mentioned this a little earlier. Is, is that we're going to be a team. Um, I, I, I believe that that's the only way that this district uh, will be successful. And, and I will tell you right now, if you're not prepared to be uh, a team, then I'll be very honest with you. I'm not, I'm not your guy. I'm not your guy. Because I believe in a team. Uh, Terrence Robinson, again, uh, I'm not a solo act. We have to be singing as a group. We may sing bad and off key, off pitch, <laughs> but we're gonna be singing together. Again, let me repeat it. If you are not committed to working with me as a superintendent, if I'm hired, I'm not, I'm not your guy. I am not your guy. I'm not coming up 1,500 miles away from home to, to be a part of something that's not successful. And I, I, need, I need you guys, and I, I'm, I don't wanna talk too much because that's how I'm gonna close tonight. But um, um, to, to be very honest with you, um, we, we all have to be on, on the same page. How am I committed to do that? I'm committing, committing to, to going all in with you, rolling my sleeves up and getting to work. I'm not coming up here to be the figurehead. I'm not, I'm, I'm not. I'm coming up here to be in the work and I expect you guys to do the same. I expect you to, um, to, to not um, be shy about getting your, hand, getting your hands dirty and, and getting to work. And that's what it's all about. Um, as I stated to you on the call, I can't ask a custodian to pick paper up from the ground if I'm not committed to doing it myself. That, that's just how I am. You know, I, I, I can't ask somebody to do something that I, I wouldn't do. And, I, I would, and trust me, every principal that has worked under me, every teacher that's worked for me, they will tell you he will do the same thing that, he, that we're doing. He's not gonna expect something of you that he won't do. And that's, that's all about being on a team and being on the same page. Okay, thank you. Ms. Oden. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Raymond. You're Oden. welcome. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Robinson. Uh, I have a two-part question. Okay. How would you implement short and long-range district goals then how would you monitor and evaluate their implementation? Great question. So, you know, in, in Texas, we call them low-hanging fruit. Those are, those are your short goals, right? Those are the things that, you know, they, they're not going to require a long period of time. Those may be those quick wins. And then those long-term goals may be multi-year, sometimes maybe one year, depends on what the particular goal is. I don't care how long the goal is, though. If we do not have periods of evaluation, then that goal is not going to be successful. Well, let me tell you what's important about a goal. As, as Coach Herm Edwards once said, a, 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 a goal without a plan is merely a wish. I know you're probably not Jets fans up in here. Herm Edwards <laughs> once said, a goal without a plan is merely a wish. So if you don't have a plan to implement that goal, guess what you're doing? All you're doing is throwing something up against the wall and expecting it to stick. And that's, that's just a prayer. That's
That's not a plan. I am committed. I'm strategic. I believe in putting a plan in place and to make sure that those goals come to fruition. But through whether the short term, whether those those are low hanging fruit or those high hanging fruit, all have to have an evaluation period within them. Long long term goals will have multi uh, multi layered opportunities for evaluation, and are we meeting those goals? But as a leader, I'm not afraid to stop and say, "Look, this is not working. We got to do some tweaking. We got to do some changes here." That's what leaders do. Why would I wait till the, all the way to the end when I know it's not working at the first two first two notches of that ten notch plan? We got to stop. Well, let me stay, let me correct that. We're not going to stop. Let's do a pause. Let's call a timeout. Let's reevaluate this. How do we, we change the outcome? We're, we're getting, the outcome that we, we're getting is not what we want. So what adjustments do we need to make? That's what leaders do. That's what, that's what uh, when you have a system in place and when you're evaluating things, that's what, that's what needs to happen. And that's what I will do, whether it's short term or long term. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm next. Um, describe an instructional innovation that you have led which improved student performance and achievement. And did this program reduce or eliminate the achievement gap for students of color, students in poverty, or students who are English language learners? I just realized I had my mask on. Did you hear that? I did. I okay. Did. So... Let me let me give you a, a real example. Um, following my first year as a principal of Holland Middle School, Holland Middle School happens to be the middle school that I attended as a student, and so to to now be the principal was was uh, it was a proud moment in my life. But following my first year as a middle school principal, I realized that something had to change because we were not getting the outcomes that we wanted. I wasn't happy with what was going on, okay? And so, as a leader, you have to figure out if something is not working, then what do you do differently? And so what I realized as a middle school principal, and it's the first time middle school principal, that we have to benefit our kids more. We have to put things in place to make our kids want to be here, to make, to, to make learning fun and engaging, and at the same time, um, get the outcomes that we want. So let, let me tell you what we did, and, and this is a, I'm gonna try to be short as I can with this. Following that particular year, I held, I held a retreat. And this retreat was over a, a two week period, I think it was three days over a two week period. I brought in some older teachers, some newer teachers to the campus, I brought in parents, I brought in administrators, and we worked, and we re redid our vision, our mission, and our goals. We wrote, we wrote everything. And what I realized out of that was we had to take a two-step approach to improving the outcomes of our students. One, we had to change the culture of our campus. I think the first thing that you, in order to get the outcomes that you want, you have to change culture. If people are unhappy, if students can't focus in class, teachers are not uh, teaching because of their, their distractions, administrators are, are overwhelmed with things there, there's a culture problem. And we had to change the culture of that campus. So that was the first thing that we worked on, was changing culture and remaking, and remaking that. And so this is, what I, this is what we did as a team. We created what we call the Cougar Creed, okay? The Cougar Creed. And when I tell you it, it was the best thing since sliced bread, I'm not, not making it up. So what we did with the Cougar Creed was simple. If C-R-E-E-D, we had it posted throughout the building, okay? The C stand, stood for consistent learning. The R was reevaluating our performance and so forth. So we had, and, and what we did every day was we announced it on the, on the school announcements. The kids would repeat after me. This was the only time of the day that I allowed them to scream as loud as they wanted to. <laughs> and, and when I said, when I, when I started it out, they repeated after me. But within that, the E was evaluating our own performance. So not only did we rebuild a culture, but we started to remake how we, the, the way that we looked at instruction. 
we started evaluating. And when we evaluated our, our, our learning, we looked at it from a student standpoint, looked at it from a teacher standpoint, and then an administrative standpoint. And we held each other accountable. Yes, our students held their teachers accountable. Our students said, hey, I, I only scored this on this particular objective, uh, Mr. Robinson, because I didn't understand the way it was taught and because uh, I, I need, you know, I don't learn that way. These are conversations that our kids would, would, would give back to, to us as, as the, the adults. And so what we had to, real, we realized at that particular point is, okay, this is student input. And now students are looking at their performance and saying, okay, something has to change. So I remember being in the hallway, we had a student who was late for class, like every period. And so uh, my, 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 my administrators had to lap their iPads. And then we had our data charts in our iPads. And so I remember one of our administrators pulling a young lady to the side who was already late for class. And he said, look at your data. He said, you scored this on the last assessment. You should be the first one in class. We don't have time to waste. Now, he didn't embarrass her, but she knew because we, we look at data, so she knew. But to, to her surprise, administrators were looking at the same data that their teachers were looking at and that they were looking at. So they knew this was bottom up and bottom down. Everybody's looking at the same thing. So we're looking at the same numbers and trying to get to the same outcome. And we committed to that as a school. So guess what happened in two years? We were high flying. And they were asking us, well, what are you doing over there? How are you doing it? Are, are you doing it illegal? You know what I'm saying. Because when your scores jump so much, you know if people look at you funny, right? I said, no problem. We'll just do it again next year. And guess what? We built a culture. The culture of high expectations was there. Teachers didn't want to leave. Teachers wanted to stay. Kids were staying. Our enrollment was growing. Our discipline rates were down. But let me give you another, another uh, component to that, what would what, what work with culture and instruction. We built in social emotional components to support our kids. I, I contracted with CIS, Communities and Schools, through United Way. We, we contracted uh, with, with uh, the, the program, is, is I'm losing my thought, I can't even think of the program right now, it'll come to me in a second, I'll, I'll yell it out on the next answer, trust me. Um, but but we, we, we brought in a couple of different components, that component was dealing with social skills. Because if you have kids who are getting in trouble for what we consider level one and two offenses, it's not major, but it's just the social skills they may lack. They, they may lack the, the they, you know, they don't know how to communicate properly. Or they may not, not, not understand the importance of doing things in a certain manner. Social skills, communication, how to function. So we had to bring in individuals to project class, and it will come to me, project class. <laughs> Brought in project class. And all they did was work on social skills. So with those two combinations of CIS and project class, we built in those components for our students. Scores shot up. So it's a combination of things, but again, long answer, culture, number one, instruction. Once we built the culture in, our kids were able to focus and our instruction became that much better and our scores went up as a result. All right, thank you. Ms. Timmons? Yes, hello, Dr. Robinson. Okay, do you encourage participation of employees in any district decisions? If so, what process will you use? How are administrators, teachers, and staff recognized for their accomplishments? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a great answer. I, I, I believe in uh, being a cheerleader for, you know, I'm not going to put the pom-poms, uh, pom-poms in my hand. I will probably put the pom-poms, I don't even put the skirt on, but I'll put the pom-poms in my hand. Y'all get it. Uh, but, but, but the thing about is I, 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 I am the biggest cheerleader. I want to acknowledge those individuals and the things that they're doing well. And so uh, when it comes to um, how do we acknowledge them so we could do it on a monthly basis for teacher of the month, um, employee of the month, staff worker of the month. But I would like to get input from those, those ad hoc committees 
So let's have a teacher ad hoc, one person from each school who could come and, and join this committee to, to meet with me. Then have a principal ad hoc committee, have um, one, maybe one principal from each level to come and meet with me. These are, you know, when, when you're sitting behind these doors uh, in central office, you, you kind of forget what it is to be out in the, in, inside of those schools. And so it's unfair for me as a person who's in the building, per se, in, in, a, in central office, to know exactly what's going on in those buildings. That's why those principles are so crucial in, in giving input and in, in providing that information that you need. I think any, any decisions that are, that are made that, that definitely affects them, I think we need to run it by ad hoc. I'm not saying I'm gonna, you know, everything is going to be what they want, but it's important to listen. It's important to listen to them. And so with teachers, with our staff, as well as our principals, I, I definitely would, would have an active ad hoc committees uh, and, and, and then, you know, acknowledgement of those individuals on a monthly basis. Um, I know one thing that we do in the district is we have a, a, a partner, one of the dealerships, they, they give a, a, the teacher of the month a car for the month to use. And it's just a partnership with one of the dealerships. So it's all about a conversation and building relationships. So why not have, you know, <laughs> you don't think those teachers that want to be the teacher of the month, they have a brand new quality ride around at least a month. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, that, that's just something that, that we do to, to incentivize and, and to, to recognize the, 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 things, the things that they're doing. They're, they're acknowledged by their, by their staffs. And, and hey, that, that's just something that we do in, in the district to, 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 uh, to highlight that. And I think that's important. We have to be creative when it comes to that. And Think outside the box, and, and 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 you know things are our teachers are down. Our teachers are struggling. They're struggling with this concurrent learning model that we that we we call it concurrent, uh, where where they they're doing you know half the kids at home and half the kids in person. That's tough. And, and I don't and any administrator who says it's easy, they haven't done it before, right? You would never hear me say that's easy. <laughs> but we have to to figure out how do we keep them motivated. And at this particular time, they, they need all the motivation they can get. So that's. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Zim. Welcome. Oh, I don't want <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I guess I thought I wasn't valuable enough for you to listen to. <laughs> anyway. Yes, ma'am. How would you assure that personnel evaluations were being performed on time and that appropriate areas of concern are included as a record of, of potential uh, issues going forward. So evaluation, are you saying from a teacher level or from an administrative level? I'm saying, all, I'm saying across the board. Across the board. Uh, all of our employees, as you, as you ably said, need to be held accountable. Yes, ma'am. Just want to make sure. No, no. So, so every, everything has a deadline. And I, I believe in sticking to those deadlines. And so those deadlines will definitely be posted to make sure that we are, if, if our teacher evaluations must be done by this particular time, they will be done. I mean, that, that's just something that uh, I, I, I don't understand why we wouldn't have that in place. That's, that's an easy fix. That's all about accountability. I, my, my, my deadlines will be set uh, for individuals to have evaluations done by. Um, we would not be putting a person on a quote unquote grow plan for a month and then saying in a month that person is not good enough to teach. That's not even fair. There has to be a period of evaluation that's, that's consistent. And so three to four months of evaluation, for example, versus one month, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, uh, more suitable. But that, that would definitely be a process that we would have to come up with uh, in finding out how do we uh, properly uh, evaluate and give feedback. Feedback is immediate in any, any situation I work in. Um, I don't understand situations where uh, principals go in, they see something that's not up to par, and then you know two weeks later they, that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. You need to you owe teachers the, the the opportunity to address something immediately because again, this evaluation is meant to support them. It's not meant to hurt them. We're here to support them. So any appraisal is is here to serve as a, to serve as a support mechanism to improve the craft. It's not to be punitive. And so that's one of the things I want to emphasize to you that we have to work on uh, growing our people. 
And so that, that growing me mechanism would probably include some type of uh, what we call, a, a, we, in Houston, we call it an ippy-dippy. So it's an individualized uh, developmental plan. In other words, look at, th look at the areas that you want to improve in as a teacher. So we allow the teachers to set that set that criteria based upon our, our, our appraisal rubric. What are the areas that you want to, we want you to pick two, not Terrence Robinson, the, the administrator, I want you to pick them. Now, if I know you're struggling with classroom management, for example, and you don't have classroom management now, we're gonna have a serious conversation and say, look, last year we scored you at this for classroom management. I think you may wanna look at this area as an area that you have for your improvement. That's just a conversation. But what did I use? I used, I had data to support that though. It's not just something I threw out there. So we're always looking at numbers to see how do our numbers support what the, the outcome that we want to achieve. And, th and this, is, th this plan, again, is developed by the, by, by the teacher and the administrator, but it's mutual. And it's based upon uh, th those areas that they feel that they, they can improve on. And then there's, there's certain areas that we look at um, for support. And now part of that support is as a principal, how can I support you? And that's the same way as a superintendent. My question to principals, how can I support you? I'm your biggest fan. I know the work. That work is tough. I would not have been a successful principal if I didn't have the same school support officer for four years. Four years, and that's a rare thing. But you know what? We grew, she knew my weaknesses, she knew my strengths, and so next year, guess what? We didn't have to start from scratch. We, we built upon what we had, and we built upon it, and we just, we, we had a great relationship. That's important, consistency. Consistency in the people that are, that are praising you, consistency in the feedback that you receive in a timely manner, and then as a, as, a, as a support, we have to walk, walk through with these, these, these principals and these teachers. We have to model for them. We can't just tell them what to do and not provide them the assistance they need. That, 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 that's not, that, you're never going to reach the outcome that you want if you don't, you don't present them with some modeling opportunities. Opportunities to see what it is that they need to get, the, the area that they need to get to, or the, or, or the level that they need to achieve. We have to present them with those opportunities for modeling. And so I'm important. And all of that is, 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 should be included in any, any type of appraisal that you're doing. You have to have those things in place. Now, I'm going I'm to I'm say next time we need to start with Z's first. <laughs> okay? I don't like you being last. All right. I know you got, you know you're used to it though, right? I knew it. I knew it. I am quite used to it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 50 years used to it. <laughs> I'm kind of used to it too. Yep. Oh, yes. Oh my goodness, I remember when I was a kid, I was like, I'm gonna marry someone with a last name that's higher up the alphabet than me, and I only moved like two letters, so I didn't achieve that goal. Um, okay, um, some of our members have uh, a second question, um, and I just wanna let you know that during the meetings, we go, we like pick numbers out of a hat, so it's random and fair, and Mrs. Zeem doesn't have to be last. <laughs> okay, uh, Ms. Bishop? Thank you again. Um, if you were to become the superintendent here, what would you like your job legacy to be? Oh wow, that, that's a great question. I, I think, and I'll, I'll just say it this way, every school that I've been principal of, I've always said that I'm gonna leave it better than I found it. So I think my legacy is to make sure that we're going up, that we're improving on, on where we are. That's, that, that definitely, I'm not the guy I don't want any buildings name after me, that's not my goal. I'm not that kind of person. Um, I, I, I'm focused on improving though. I'm focused on uh, and, and being strategic about that though. That's not something that I, I would just throw out there and say, okay, we got better. No, I'm going to provide the data for you and, and show uh, in what areas. And at the same time, I'm very transparent in saying, you know, if something didn't go as well as I would want it, I will tell you that, well, we didn't go as high as I would have liked. And these are areas that we need to focus on. But I definitely, um, I, I want to definitely make, make a, an impression um, that's um, uh, an improvement. I want people to say, you know what, I see it. I see what he's doing. 
in a good way, you know, not in a bad way. But but I, I see the improvement. I see I see the direction he's going. When people say they see your direction, then you know you're going in the right way. You're going you're, you're moving it, and that's what I want. That's what I, I really want uh, people to say. Um, but also, let, let me let me just also say this as well. I want them to say that he 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 was he never met a stranger. He was approachable. Uh, he was a people person. Uh, he was down to earth. You know, they, I want them to say that old Southern Texan guy was down to earth. <laughs> you know, and if they can say that, then I'm I'm totally fine with that, because that's that's truly who I am. I am really a down to earth person. Thank you. God. Well, I don't even know how I can follow that up, so, but I have another thing written down, so I'm going to ask it. Okay. Um, so what, and this is actually has to do with data, what research-based educational trends do you see having a significant impact on the education in the immediate future? It's, it's funny that you would ask that question because um, when we look at the policies that we make. I don't think that we truly understand how they affect kids. And I think from a policy standpoint, I've done, this is what my, uh, my dissertation covered. It's the effects of educational policies on the outcomes of students. We have to really look at the decisions we make, the, the decisions that adults make, and how they affect our babies. That that's really, you know, and I think coming into this role, I'm, that's something that I would look at very, very closely. Because again, as I told you earlier, um, you know, you, you, you look at a lot of these, these tests out there, the NAEP exam, where that looks at, and they, they will throw out the achievement gap of African Americans, for example, that are uh, significantly lower than, um, than, uh, than other, um, other races. That that may be true, but I don't dwell on those kind of things because I just think there's a lack of opportunities, as I stated earlier. I think it's it's bigger than just numbers when it comes to a test. Uh, I think if you, uh, as I stated on to you guys last week, you know I have experience as a a principal of a school who had a large um, refugee population from uh, Bhutan. And I'm telling you, when we put these kids side by side from pre-K to third grade, there was not a difference when those kids were in third grade. There was not a difference in outcomes because these babies, they had an opportunity to learn. Their parents were glad to be in the United States and they wanted their kids to learn and they were committed to it. And so um, I, I truly believe that uh, when we look at equity, um, and I asked you that question earlier. I said, when you talk about equity, what do, what do you mean? What are you looking at? And so um, I asked that question for a reason because I think that's a, that's a conversation. I think we duck too much in education. I think we conveniently uh, duck it and, and not want to address the bull by the horn. And now equity goes across the board. Again, as I stated earlier, I, I'm, I think there, there are some, some of our high flyers who are not receiving the support that they need. So I'm not just looking at you know low socioeconomic or African American or Hispanic. I'm not just looking at it from that standpoint. Equity mean you know there has to be some equality has to everybody needs to have the same opportunities and if some kids at this school do not have the opportunity to this program and this program on this side of town has all of the programs that that, that that's inequity and we have to look at things like that so to be honest with you I'm, I'm getting real I'm getting fired up on that one you know you, you're getting you're getting my my, uh, my my baritone voice right now because I'm passionate about that I'm passionate Dr. Robinson, I'm back again. Hi. Can you share strategies and programs that you have used with school staff to improve student safety and discipline across student populations in a variety of settings? So I mentioned a, a couple earlier, um, communities and schools, um, project class. Um, in, in all of my years as a principal, I think there were only one or two years where I did not have some type of social emotional component with the campus. And, and I, I, yes, it was about one or two years. And that was my first two years. Mm -hmm. So I was naive. Uh, 
but I learned quick that that our kids need those types of supports. Um, we are living in uh, uh, so, some dangerous times where um, you know schools schools should be the safe haven, but unfortunately, um, you, you see it far too much where uh, it, it's it's an unsafe environment. But you know, reading your signs outside, you know, if you see something, say something. That's the first thing I noticed when I when I pulled up in the parking lot. When you see something, say something. And kids have to be, they have to feel, like, feel comfortable enough, though, to have that conversation. So it's all about a relationship. And, and one of the things that I'm committed to doing, if I'm selected as the superintendent, is looking at the, the types of counseling services that we're offering uh, to our students. Do we have enough and what types are we offering? Um, as well as social workers. I think you have eight or nine in the district I saw on the website. Um, I, I, I don't understand why, I, I understand why, but I think it's important that every school should have one, okay? Um, and I do know, understand it comes down to budget, I get that. But that's how important it is though. That we, we, if we expect our students to perform at the levels that we, we expect them to perform at, our kids have to be able to focus. They can't worry about their mom not being able to make rent. Our kids, you know, I don't take for granted that the two, two meals that our kids eat, breakfast and lunch, are the only two meals they have all day. I don't take that for granted. I believe that a lot of our kids are like that. A lot of our kids are latchkey. When they get home, there's nobody there to greet them. So we have to put in um, a system that support that and, you know, looking at uh, evening dinners for our athletes, those kind of things uh, where, um, you know, if, if we have a situation where, uh, you know, a kid is isn't at, in, that, in that type of situation, but he's playing sports or he's involved in after school activities, that, that, that kid could have a third meal. We have to be creative in, in trying to figure out how we can support our kids. How, how can we build those systems uh, around, uh, around them and protect them? We have, to be, we, have, we have to be protectors of our babies. These are our babies. We have to be protectors. And, and I'm a parent. I, I won't, you know, I talk to my daughter every day about how was your day at school? What happened? Well, dad, this happened. Okay, well, what, did, what, what, what was their response to it? Did, did somebody help? parents want to know that there are support systems within our schools. They want to know that. They want to feel that comfort level. And I want to ensure that that, that same support here is at Nashville. I want, to make, I want our kids to feel safe. I want them, if they see something, to say something. But that's having people available. That's having people in place to go and support, not wait for things to, to come to them, but who know how to anticipate you know if a kid is not having a great day, why not go and have that conversation, but know how to have that conversation? Not go in and say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, who's who's going to engage you in a conversation when you just come out and ask, what's wrong with you? But knowing who, who has a relationship with that kid, hey, so-and-so is having a, it looks like he's having a bad day. Can you go and talk to him? I know you have a great relationship with him. That's, that's all about having a team in place, though. And I, I am definitely committed to that if I'm, if I'm selected. Thank you. Ms. Johnson? Now you're back to the one from New York with that accent, you know. I could yes, use a team yes, in place for me today. I've had a bad day. You know, where's that team for me? How would you handle staff complaints that have reached your desk and would you have a meeting with the board to notify us? So I, I think it would definitely depend on the situation. I, I don't think that every situation will call for uh, any type of, of board acknowledgement. Or, or I, I think it definitely depends on what the situation is. I think if there, um, definitely if there's some type of grievance that's taking place, I think that would definitely uh, be something that we would need to discuss. Um, I think it, it would it would have to be a situation by situation. I don't think there's a uh, set standard that I would say, okay, every time we have a situation, because some situations are not that serious, you know, it's all about how you handle it. But I think in dealing with the situation as a superintendent, uh, I think it's important though, 
that we work our way up the ladder. I, I believe in chain of command 100%. I, I, I have, when I have people who work for me and I have teachers all the time that call or email, they call, not, not call, they email me. I'm having a problem with this, 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 this principal's done this, this, and this, okay? I call the principal, say, look, I have a call from one of your teachers. This is what they said. Have they discussed it with you? You know what, uh, nine times out of 10, what they tell me? No. This is the first time I'm hearing about it. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so to me, that's, that's not something that I need to jump into. I need to give that principal the opportunity to address it. And normally I don't even hear back from the situation because now it's addressed. Uh, usually in that, that type of situation, they're trying to get their principal in trouble. They feel like that's what's, what's going to happen. And I need some immediate action. That, that, that's not how it works, though. Uh, we have to empower our people to address situations. They're in place for a reason. We have principals who are in these positions for a reason. We have assistant superintendent, and I, I want to give them that, that a power to do that. Now, I, I want to develop the type of relationship with them to let them know that if there's ever a situation that they can't handle, don't be afraid to come to me. Because that's not going to be a sign of weakness or a sign of, of, of that, that you're inadequate. Sometimes you, you, you run into a situation that you're just not familiar with and you need to, you know, toss it around with somebody. I still do that. I do that all the time. I call my boss and say, look, I have a situation I have never seen before. <laughs> How can we address this? What do you have as a suggestion? That, that's, but that's also a relationship as well. And, and I want my principals to feel that they are supported in that and that, you know, everything is not going to come <laughs> to the board and they're not going to be put on blast. And no, it, it, it has to work itself up. But it, to, to come back to your original question, it really, really would depend on the severity of it. And it would depend on if you're talking about some type of policy and, and uh, infraction and, and situation of, of grievances and things of that nature, that's when we will definitely will come to the board. Okay, thank you. I really should have had Miss Bishop's question last. That one was. That was tough, wasn't it? It was, and it was a good kind of last question. <laughs> I googled uh, it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that clarification. Okay, um, so Dr. Robinson, you had asked for us to come back to it. you at the end of our um, and, and formal I, I questions. And I remember though, I removed that slide, but I'm good though. I'm good. I, I have a backup plan. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I, I have removed that slide, but, but you asked a question earlier. I did. You asked me what, what's, what's going on with this red wagon, okay? So uh, a, a quick story. This is actually made by my daughter. So she made this. She, she's a, she, she thinks she's an artist. She's an artist. So right. just for the people in the audience, okay. Dr. Robinson has on a pin that has a little red wagon on it. All right. um, so let me, but let me tell you the, the story of the red wagon. So we all, we all as, as children have experienced uh, the red wagon as a toy. If you didn't have one on your own, you knew somebody that had one. So I remember being a child, as a child, sitting in a red wagon and being frustrated. I'm sitting in this red wagon and I am frustrated. Why am I frustrated? Because I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Okay? So I remember my dad coming to me. He said, son, he said, a wagon is useless if nobody is pulling it. Mm -hmm. He said, a wagon is useless if nobody's pulling it. So what I, what I decided to do was to wear this tonight with the red wagon. And I'm going to tell you why as, as I close out. For 21, 22 years in education, I've ridden in, in the red wagons. I've had superintendents, principals, they've all pulled me. I've jumped in a bunch of wagons and I've been pulled. And what I'm asking you to do is to allow me to pull it this time. I want you to jump in the wagon. I want the community of Nashua to jump in this red wagon. And I want you to give me the opportunity to pull it. That's why I said, let me come back to that because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out with that that in order for this district to be successful, everybody has to agree to allow me to pull that wagon and you be, come along for the ride. You tell me left or right, Terrence. But let me tell you, when I pulled that red wagon, we only go in one direction, 
just one direction, and that's forward. Because you can't pull the wagon backwards. <laughs> We're going forward. I, I want to personally um, thank the board for allowing me to be here. This is truly an honor. It, it, it really is. I am, um, uh, I'm, I'm emotional, but I, I will tell you, I'm holding it in very well right now. I am, um, I'm only here because I have, I had such a great foundation as a kid. It's a great foundation. Um, I had a talk with my dad on Sunday night. Um, and, you know, told him, hey, I'm, I'm going flying up to Nashville. My dad was so supportive. Uh, I lost my mom three years ago from cancer. And, you know, it was one of those things that happened so fast. You didn't get a chance to, to even process it. And so to have his support meant a lot to me. It meant a lot. And um, I saved the call, the last call. I had to, you know, I had to get permission to come here. I'm not going to lie to y'all. I had to get permission. My wife was on board, but... I had to call my, my mom's sister, who's my godmother. I had to call her. And uh, I told her what, what was going on, and she gave me permission. <laughs> she said, you know, it's only three and a half hours away, and you have my permission to go. Because I'm still a child. <laughs> I'm still a child. I, I will never forget that I'm still a child. I, I, I'm humble as they come. Um, you know, I, I, I think that was you, Ms. Johnson, that said, yes, ma'am, you got to get used to these. Somebody said that. Was it, was it Ms. Johnson? You said that, right? That, that's just how I am. You know, Miss um, Olden, I, I, I had to open the door for you. I had, I had to open the door. I just, I, I, I can't walk through a door and not open the door for you. I just can't do that. But that's just how I am. That's how, that's how I am. But to close out, honestly, um, I, I'm, I'm like a used car. I'm as is. What you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. I'm a, I'm a used car, and that, that you know there 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 are no there there are no hidden secrets. That this is Terrence Robinson. He's hungry for the opportunity. Uh, I'm ready for that opportunity, and looking forward to working with you if the if um, if the decision is made for me to come up here. And I appreciate again you giving me the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. We really appreciate you taking the time to come up here and meet with us tonight. Um, at this time, um, I think we will um, take a recess for, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, um, and then the board will come back um, and we'll have um, a non-public session. I don't believe that we'll have any votes after the non-public session. Um, so that's the plan. Um, it is 7.31, um, so we'll call recess and we'll resume at like 7.40, 7.45. Okay, thank you everybody. Oh, I can bang my gavel.